Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing, live show number 393. I am your host, Lauren Gray, and yes, our background is a little different. We are still in the midst of getting work done from our hurricane damages to our office, and at this moment, everything in our office is in a big, happy pile, so to speak, <laughs> when it comes to drywall and putty and stuff in piles. And so we are broadcasting from our World Amalgam headquarters of Hospital Digital Marketing, in another location. Anyways, uh, I hope uh, that it's not a matter of the background. It is about the content today. Thank you, everyone, that is joining us live uh, on all of the platforms that we broadcast on, whether it be Facebook, LinkedIn, um, YouTube, uh, Twitter, and also Twitch. And then, of course, as always, on our TV channel, the Hospitality Channel, that you can find on your Roku TV, Amazon TV, Apple TV, or Google TV. Uh, and thank you for everyone that watches us there. And as a reminder for everyone, we do recast the show to uh, accommodate for all of the different time zones. I know via the TV station, we broadcast to 209 countries, um, but we also um, try to shift the replays to be a little bit more uh, helpful of time zones. For instance, we'll do 11.30 a.m. Wednesday, uh, Sydney, Australia time. And we will also do 11.30 a.m. Um, London, UK time, or EU time to help with our EU friends and our Middle East friends as well. By the way, thank you very much for those that have been watching us from Dubai and appreciate the feedback from the emails as well, which everyone can send us an email at any time at Lauren at Hospitality Digital Marketing. I reply to each and all emails. Uh, so thank you very much for the insights and so forth, which actually kind of brought us up to our topic today. Um, as with most of our conversations, when we talk about the big differences of how to market independent brand, uh, independent hotels to branded hotels, we get into the barriers and the walls. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I've, I've always, I've shared everyone's frustrations as to brands ineptitude when it comes to supporting and their arrogance in saying that they are in full control of their marketing message for the individual hotels, when in fact, their marketing strategy is dominated by brand marketing. And the product, your hotel, is simply a factor of that. It is not a feature. It is an aspect of inventory availability based on what they do for brand marketing. So consider if it was a strata, the brand marketing goes down to a certain level, but all of the localization value, uh, and uniqueness of your hotel, individuality of your hotel is not there. It's a, only a part of the process of what's usually offered. And you usually have to compete with your frenemies uh, all of the brand hotels that are in your market that are vying for the same market destination demand. So it never truly is like, let's feature this hotel. Yes, you can give them a whole mess more money. And yes, they will add aspects of your hotel's individuality. But it's always with the caveat being, if this isn't what you want, here's a whole Pandora's box of other branded hotels. So not that I've already talked not badly enough about brand initiatives, but let's bring it into the context of today's topic. Uh, and that is tools or things that you can do, even as a branded hotel, which what came from emails, uh, is what can I do about branded marketing? And they brought up the conversation that we have been using on interstitial pages. More specifically, the topic today is interstitial pages and funnels, how to beat the limitations of brand. And I say the limitations of brand, let's, I don't want to ignore the fact that brand has a value. Uh, I think they overcome, uh, inflate it uh, as to what they think they're contributing to your top line revenue. Uh, I've heard as far as 30 and 40% or higher in some circumstances, depending upon the market that they're indicating, uh, of brand contribution. I find that to be uh, a gross overestimate. It's by default that their brand name is being used because that is the name uh, that you are forced to use in identifying yourself. So it's a self-fulfilling contribution percentage. Uh, if somebody was looking for a hotel close to XYZ location and didn't refer to a brand by doing so, brand can contribute it. But by the very nature of the fact that they would have to use your brand marketing to get to you, they take credit to say, well, they were looking for our brand, XYZ Marriott or XYZ Hilton or XYZ HG product is what they were looking for. That gives us the, the capabilities of saying that it is to the benefit from brand that you got that business. I disagree. I do believe the brand has a contribution. So there is a positive aspect of it. Uh, I think brand now is more of a value proposition for uh, the logistics and operations as to aggregated contracts, uh, 
diminishment of, of uh, purchases when it comes to ff &E and so forth because of the national context leveraging that they have. And of course, at the very boil down of it, which always infuriates me, a lot of it has to do with getting the finances to open a hotel. Brands have a huge, if not monopolistic advantage in uh, allowing banks or being able to assist banks in giving the finances needed for a hotel's uh, creation and or purchase because brand lead, lends to the credence of the value proposition of the uh, brick and mortar asset. I would love for somebody to change that, but it's the reality of our world. But getting back to our topic of discussion, interstitial pages and funnels, how to beat the limitations of brand. Limitations of brands are this. They are homogenizing their marketing platforms to as vanilla as possible, uh, to dummy proof them, so to speak. You don't have to, as an example, have to understand how to do meta search. You only have to go into the platform that they've created in combination with Cody to indicate how much money you want to spend for. You have no control over the mitigation of how that money is being spent. You only are giving them the authorization to spend the money, trusting on their algorithms to yield the best return on value for you. And the value that, that Cody has by operating here for the brand is quite simply, uh, they are the licensed vendor to do that. So they are the licensed vendor to use the trademark terms and names associated with the brand. They also offer uh, a variety of other uh, paid campaign services in that same platform. Again, down to vanilla. It's about just give us money and we'll figure out your paid campaigns. Just give us money, we'll do your paid social for you. Just give us money, we'll do your travel ads. There's not a component of strategy except for the marginalization of how much budget goes to which category. And even then, you have to modify their forced recommendations. So when you choose the dates that you're willing to spend money on, it will calculate out what it thinks you should spend on each of the categories that they're making available. All you have to do at that point is make sure the money's in the bank for them and off it goes. That's not market strategy. That's default presence. And it's not to the benefit of the hotel in particular, as much as it is mostly to the benefit of the brand with your hotel being the asset that it sells. You benefit as the second half of that statement, not the first half. So as you can tell, I'm a little biased to this, that doing more for yourself and especially doing for yourself what isn't done by brand are the two key elements of why third party agencies, organizations, or just internal hotel operations should take it upon themselves to find means and methodologies of marketing themselves. Well, that's the conversation is to the topic, interstitial pages. If it's an unfamiliar term, it came out of the fact of, uh, think of it as landing pages. Um, in the process of how things work, if you were to go to Google and create Google ads and you want them to go somewhere, well, first you have to construct the ad. And we've had many discussions as to creating the filtering as to who sees this ad. That is your campaign strategy, your targeting, what have you. Once that's done, you determine what the context of the ad is for. Maybe it's just general awareness of yourself. Maybe it's a specific promotion you're doing. Maybe it's because of a related area activity event, or maybe a segment type of business. You're looking for group sales or smart business or something, and you'd like to help yourself by creating ads. The big question then is, where do those ads go? And this is when you get to a choke point for brand's value to you. You're basically faced with three viable options. One, you default it to your opening splash page of your property on the mothership brand, which if you're not familiar, brand.com slash you. Um, or you can point it to if you have the tolerance within your content on your mothership splash page to have a aspect like a promotion code, you know, where there's an explanation to what the promotion is inclusive of, and or a, a module that they offer, perhaps for your weddings, that might have a form, okay, a lead gen form for it or something. And then the third option for you is just going to the booking engine. Usually at that point, you're asking the user that even though you were talking about something in particular with the ad, they now have to rediscover the connection between the ad that got them there and the content that they have to navigate through to get to the relevant information. For instance, if you're offering a particular offer and you don't have the opportunity to direct it directly to the offer page, you only have the idea that you want to go to a booking engine that doesn't exactly explain the offer. Think of like Park and Go or um, Breakfast Included or Food and Beverage Credit or something that you've added to, uh, to the offer. 
but the page for that offer doesn't really truly fill in or flesh out the content associated with the promotion. So you're left with the fact that the implied value is you kind of know what it is by the name of the promotion. Here's where you can book it. Fingers crossed everything else about where we are and the price and the inventory availability and the room types and the service scores all hit the mark for you. So you don't need all that fleshing out details to make the decision of acquisition. It's a lot of gambling that goes on with that and a lot of wasted money driving people to just that limited bit of content. So again, the three real brand variations that you have are to your splash page of, of the mothership for your hotel, to potentially a module or promotion page that has been created, if you create a specialty code for it, um, and the other is just a booking engine. And usually the booking engine means more by offers, which means that even though you were sending them for a particular offer, they now see all your offers. So if you have a better rate offer than the one that was solicited to the getting them to that point, you're basically putting money on the table because instead of getting the promotion that you were hoping they would buy, they compared you against the other promotions you have that would, in your market strategy, might be a better option for them. Okay. Until interstitial pages and funnels come along. Now, let me describe what the difference of the conversation. Interstitial pages, aka landing pages, used to be the bane of spam. Uh, an ad says that you're this, and it talks about an offer, and then it doesn't go to the website of that product. It goes to a different place. That hijacking is what prevented landing pages from working. Because Google and Bing and everybody else that did search engine results and, and paid campaigns would catch that as being spam, or they would heavily penalize you as to the authentic uh, the authority of the ad compared to the landing, and you'd pay a high premium per click to steer that traffic over because of the lack of relevancy. If anybody doesn't know your CPC cost program in the eyes of Google, the more people that use your ad and actually go to your ad and interact with your ad to wherever it lands to creates an authentic, uh, authority for you. Through that authority, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have to charge you as much to be in have relatively high positioning for the ad placements on SERP pages, search engine result pages. If you're redirecting them or sending them to a place that doesn't seem to be where it should land and there's no authority to it or there's a high bounce rate from people to hit the ad and then realize they're being brought someplace they didn't intend to, then it costs you more if you're, relative enough that they don't get blocked first off, but you're relevant enough that while well, you're paying a premium because you don't have that full authority going to that. To some degree that still carries over. Interstitial pages will always fight for relevancy, but Google has gotten smarter. Rather than just looking at the link of where an ad goes to, they're able to now to crawl where that link goes to, and they can determine from their own algorithms whether that landing page that they, the ad was brought, brought, brought you to is relevant to the ad itself. And so you can do this without necessarily being penalized if the content that you put on the interstitial page, the landing page, is all about the ad that brought them there. And this is the real value proposition because the limitation the brand presents is that you don't have these tools, these avenues of content expansion. Um, you can deep link, which is what it's called when you were to say, have an ad go to a social media post. We've talked about this on the live show before, where you did a post about an offer you're doing for an event, and you use that post link as the, the destination of the ad that you've done. And it's relevant to the context of the ad and relevant by the content that's there. But Google doesn't like Facebook. Facebook doesn't like Google. So it doesn't necessarily reward you that you're driving a deep link ad to a platform that's not is in simpatico with the, the, the platform you're advertising on. So it costs you a lot more to do that. Now, with so many tools, and by the way, our podcast today, we're going to dive into some very specific tools, page makers, uh, switchy, uh, jot URL, um, which addresses how to make these pages, how to make additional subdomains that are relevant to you. So for most brand owners, they know that you know, making vanity sites is a no-no. Brands don't want you to have them. They've been shutting them down, not allowing you, making trademark restrictions to so forth and so on. And very, very few uh, places have been able to keep their vanity sites from way back when, mainly through the arguments of uh, performance of them compared to a brand's offering. I and mean, I've been literally that person that has had those arguments in front of legal teams and so forth and stated my case like I was in a, a trial um, to justify why they should be remained in existence. But it, it is just a matter of time. It's an erosion process. 
Uh, the brands will circumnavigate because of their authority about being the brand and the content that they can surround that one hotel's property vanity site with additional content because of all the other brand properties that are related to the same destination, kind of like what you see OTAs and TripAdvisor doing. I should say TripAdvisor is an OTA as well at this point, but just the difference between consumer sentiment content and OTA content. And that authority of having so much content around the destination itself that you are just a small piece of it. That's why they can show up even better than you for yourself because they have so much more relevant outside additional content that about you that you don't even have about yourself. And that creates that, uh, that issue of um, authority in Google's eyes. Like that page on TripAdvisor actually has more relevance to your property than your property does to itself. But again, going back to the interstitial pages, the idea of now having a place that you can expand content all about what the ad is being driven to it. So if you're doing a promotion like a park and go for an airport hotel, um, you have the choices of I go to the splash page of the website for me on the mothership, which means they have to discover where the park and go offer is, which is usually under offers and they need to compare other offers as well. The other is maybe I have an actual park and go landing page for the offer in which case it has a limited character count as to how much space I can discuss what the offer is good for, pending brand approval. Um, and then the third is simply driving it to the booking engine that auto fills the code for it, okay, the actual link to the booking engine that brings up the park and go offer. And that's your choices. That's what you have. Um, of course, in the brand world, they offer you CRM uh, capabilities in our, uh, you know, email sends, that are clustered, of course you have to pay for all this in addition, more. Uh, you're shared with by many. You actually are in a waiting list oftentimes with other properties that are also trying to get that front of the line presence in your market. And gosh knows you have a lot of frenemies because between the merger of, Margaret, of, of Starwood and Marriott as an example, people that were competitors are now on your same brand profile. Um, the dilution of offer of brand types based on your brand between the IHGs, the Hiltons and so forth, there's five flavors of Hilton right next door to you. And where you have the exclusive rights to your brand of Hilton, it has a simpatico relationship with other brands in the Hilton family that are sometimes the prices, convenience, or service scores make it that they'll stay at another place, even though they don't need that type of room type. But other things may be more value. So now you're fighting against rate strategies of your frenemies. Anyways, I digress. So creating interstitial pages, landing pages, allows you to add content to pages that you don't normally have access to. You can explain more, you can share more, you can add different visuals, you can add your own videos, you can add your own content. Of course, your booking engine still goes to brand. It still has to go to brand. You're not, you're not creating an alternative way for them to book. Uh, it, but it does allow you the freedom of expanding the content to help the conversion value of what the ad generates for you. Uh, that, that, that incentive value of an interstitial page is incredible. The difference between, I and mean, this is legitimately firsthand experience, having to have driven it to the splash page of a brand or to a potential uh, module or promotion quasi page or just to the booking engine compared to an interstitial page is exponentially different. Adding that additional content, adding more things that you think that would need. For instance, going back to the parking lot discussion, we create an interstitial page for an airport hotel, branded hotel. Information about weather. Current weather is on the interstitial page. Information about um, local things of interest to do on the interstitial page. Um, was Oh, flights, arrivals and departures to the airport that was near. Also on the interstitial page. None of those things exist. Oh, and food that we're offering at the restaurant, at the hotel, on the interstitial page. There are menus and so forth. Where's your menus for your restaurants? It's your hotels. If it's a PDF on your uh, brand, that's the option you usually have. Here, much better to actually have interactive where there's images and descriptions and things. You can have nutritional information. You can have any design you want to them on interstitial pages. And it creates a huge value asset for better conversions of your ad campaigns. So now you can create pages for anything. A page for this promotion, that promotion, that promotion, or a page about additional information that you want to be a participant of. You can do community sponsored support things where you can create your own interstitial page that you might be advertising your affiliation 
put the charity or community event in your market. And by so doing, feature yourself related to all the other localized stuff. This is nothing that brand does for you. So the interstitial pages are huge helps for that. Now, the other component to my topic was funnels. Funnels, you have used interstitial pages for a long time. They, they create sometimes issues because the funnel pages created, and funnel being a modality of engagement with you. Uh, if, if they went to a, a Facebook ad, or they went to your Facebook and you were targeting them again with a Facebook ad in a retargeting program, and then from that, if they didn't engage with that, then they, you would do maybe potentially retargeting on Google. And how many days does that run and where would you send them? The, where would you send them part of these things is uh, the funnel aspect of usages of interstitial pages. You'd be creating pages within the funnel platforms. And we have had on the live show a couple of times, uh, um, one in particular, uh, show 342, I think it was, where we literally talked about two funnel operations, workflow operations, as to if this happens, then if they reacted, this is what happens. Kind of like an email workflow. Send an email. Did they open it or not? If they didn't, resend it X days later, change the subject line to this. If they did open it, then if they didn't click on anything, then send them additional information different from the email, because obviously they didn't see anything they're interested in, and use this subject line. If they did click on something, take what they clicked on and come back with a second offer or an incentive value addition offer based on what they clicked on. So that workflow is constantly trying to scoop up where the interaction got dropped off. That's what a workflow does. Here's the function. If they engage as directed, they'll get to the conclusion point of conversion. If they drop off at any point, then there should be an alternative re-engagement on platform shift if necessary for them to once again be given the opportunity in a different format or different channel where that interest might be perceived differently than the one that didn't resonate with them that they didn't engage with. That's a workflow. Funnels work the same way. Engagement, return, retargeting, engagement, variation, return, retargeting. And at every stage of that return, retargeting, they have to go somewhere. That going somewhere is an interstitial page. It's a landing page designed specifically for what you're driving there. It's not a website that people can navigate to. Uh, in the world of websites, these used to be called orphan pages. They were left alone with the, the, the navigation to leave them to go to the main site was there, but the navigation on the main site to get to them wasn't. So unless you were driven to the page directly, you wouldn't know that that page existed. It was not a navigation choice. So, but on, the, on that orphan page would be given the options to go into other places of the website. And unless you had a back button, you would not be able to make it back to your original page. Those orphan pages could be dynamic. They could be created so that depending upon what brought them there, customization was in there. Did I have your name already? Did I already know what channel you had used to get to there so I can refer to it? Do I know your geography? And that brings us to some interesting parts as to the advancement of what interstitial pages have become. There is now the ability on some of the tools we'll talk about on the podcast today that you can create geolocation. People based on their location will see a certain version of your uh, interstitial or landing page based on them clicking on your ad. So if you want people in a feeder market to be identified or addressed because they're in that market, you can put the dynamic content in there with the qualifier that if anybody in this area clicks on this ad, this is the version they're going to see with the inclusion of the unique dynamic content associated because of the geography location that they're in. That's incredible stuff. That's not what brand is offering you. Brand, as I said before, goes back to write us a check, we'll put it into the funnel, and we'll churn out what we think is best, and best being for brand. So that is my uh, chasing after brand today. Uh, they frustrated me on some answers I've had with uh, clients about their responses to uh, functionalities requests, trademarks, variations, and so forth. And I am frustrated with the fact that they say that they do it but they don't do it and they don't allow you to do it, which is infuriating that you can't use your name of your own hotel. And they said that only they could do it, but then they charge you more money to do that for you. So there's terms for that. As it is, thank you so very much for listening to my uh, in-depth and passionate rebuttal to brands limitations by talking about interstitial pages and funnels and how to beat the limitations of brand. 
Um, again, we have our podcast after this, which we'll recap a little bit of our show here a little bit, but we're going to dive deep into at least three of the tools associated with creating good interstitial pages and the analytics capability of tracking them. Oh my gosh, you get Google Analytics, something I didn't even mention in the conversation where, you know, you're blind to traffic. Now you're still blind as to conversion because brand doesn't share that, not in the way of referral trend, uh, transaction conversions, unless they're running it for you. Um, but actually getting Google traffic to know how they interacted, not only from your ad campaigns that you get traffic from in, in analytics, but also the engagement with what they clicked on in your interstitial page, where they're really interested in the current weather or the current arrival departures or the current local events or your menu. And of course, you can create a funnel if they did ping into your menu stuff and look at your food. That's a whole new retargeting for a funnel to readdress what they looked at and say, oh, do you, you love our local cuisine of poutine? Great. Here's some more information about poutine, maybe the history, maybe the other variations outside of your own, maybe a special coupon for them to get poutine at, at your own restaurant in your hotel, whatever that is. The idea is that you have that as an availability into your market strategy is vastly different than the brand restriction limitations that they offer or don't offer really. So again, thank you so very much for watching us live on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and Twitch. Twitch is for those people who use their gaming consoles for Rich Media. Um, we are on multiple pages in Facebook, multiple Twitter. Um, one channel for that, for the multi-streaming. Uh, and YouTube, multiple pages on YouTube. Um, but the TV channel is free and available for everyone. The live show is, as also our software and uh, services showcase. Uh, that's always on the free side. That you can always go to your Roku TV, uh, Amazon TV, Google TV, or Apple TV, and just look for Hospitality Channel. Add it as a channel. Sign up. You don't have to pay. Just sign up. You register so you can see the free side, and you're good to go. So, again, thank you for all those that watch this live around the world uh, on our simulcasts. I welcome everybody that will get to play this back on the replays that we do 11.30 a.m., uh, both Sydney, Australian, and London, U.K. time. And uh, for everyone that follows and listens to us on our podcast, thank you so very much for that. And you shortly get to hear about the functional workings of tools and the techniques of using them. So until then, my name is Lauren Gray. Thank you for the privilege of your time. I look forward to talking to you next week.